and you want to be on the forefront of change. You actually want to be a pioneer of change. That's the best place to be because now you are actually directing where people are going to follow you. You're listening to The Other 50%, A Her Story of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. This episode is brought to you by the entertainment payroll company, Extreme Reach. They have the most comprehensive suite of tools and services to support all areas of media and content creation, from tax incentive support to accounting software and payroll services. I've seen their software. It's beautiful. If you're producing film and television, you should call them and tell them I sent you. And as a bonus, they are committed to including and promoting women, and I could not be happier that they are a sponsor of this podcast. This week, I got to have a great conversation with Sasheen Artis. She is a writer-producer with over 20 years experience in live events, documentaries, talk shows, and scripted programming, such as Fight for $15 and its impact on small business, the school-to-prison pipeline, the plight of New Orleans residents on the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, and a one-night-only Prince concert at the Conga Room in LA. Sasheen also produced the late-night talk show, Tava Smiley. Currently, she is in development with several TV and film projects and co-chairs the Producers Guild of America Power of Diversity Master Workshop. We talked about her incredible journey from homelessness to producing and broke down the business case for diversity. This is a good one. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, and the merchandise. I just put in some great coffee tumblers and mugs. You can also listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. In fact, if you're trying to listen to it on a podcast platform and it's not there, let me know so I can make sure that it is there. And if you haven't already, check out our other two podcasts, The Kiss My Age Show, which is where women of a certain vintage, you know, grown-ups, talk about anything and everything and all the things that matter. Hosted by Lasta Drakovich, Karen Samuelson, and me. And if you fall into that category, please join the Facebook group and join in the conversation. And Exit 38, it's a show where Emily Van Dyne and Sean Patrick Hughes, who seem to be opposites from a political perspective, discuss the issues of the day while trying to find common ground. Okay, here's my conversation with Sasheen. Have a listen. What a beautiful name. Thank you. Sasheen. It actually has, it has a backstory. Tell me. It's all connected to Paramount Pictures. When Marlon Brando won the Oscar for The Godfather, Mm-hmm. He sent Sasheen Littlefeather up to receive it and to talk about the plight of Native Americans in, yeah. in the world or in, in the country. And that is how I got my name. Your parents were watching that? My mom, yeah, my mom watched it and she loved the name. And so that's how I ended up with Sasheen. But how Sasheen, yeah, Sasheen spells it with a C. So it's S A C H E E N and I'm S A. S H E E N. What a beautiful story. Mm-hmm. So, um, and so my and my first job in the industry was at Paramount. So it's like I came home. Okay, <laughs> that part normally doesn't go in the podcast, but that part's going in the podcast. Uh-oh. What do you do? I am a writer and a producer, and I've been in the industry for about twenty-four or so years. Let's start with what kind of writing. I write articles and I also write scripts. Um, I transitioned from documentary filmmaking uh, a couple of years ago and decided I wanted to go back to scripted television. So in order to do that, you have to have some samples. So I said, okay, uh, let me start writing. So I wrote a crime procedural and I wrote a supernatural fun action television show and a more heartfelt drama uh, called Transition. So Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that. Tell well, me more. Well, transition, that's actually based on my personal story, and it was very, very interesting. It took a while to write the other two, but this one kind of flowed, you know, just because it was my own personal journey. But, you know, all, all the names have been changed to, yeah. protect, the, to t- protect the guilty. Um, it's always um, the guilty, right? It's, it's, never all the guilty. it's never the innocent. innocent. They don't need protection. <laughs> um, but I... Uh, I wrote it because it was a window into a time, you know, first of all, it was very difficult, so it was more cathartic, but it was a window into a time for me that 
I thought people needed to see and see in a TV space because you can watch that uh, story unfold. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, you know, I, I'm a career woman. I you know, I have a college degree from Stanford and, and all of that. But at a point in my life, I actually became homeless. And homeless is not in the sense of, oh, I'm sleeping on someone's couch. Homeless in the sense of, wow, I have nowhere to sleep and I need to be in a shelter. Um, and I was actually with my mom at the time, and you know she's you know what twenty something years older than me, and so it was really difficult to first of all you know I couldn't ask my friends to take in both me and my mother, so it was sort of like okay Lord what should I do because you know the the sheriff comes he evicts you and he's like thank you have a good day and I'm like okay what's next. Um, and Actually, can mm -hmm. we talk about right before that? Uh -huh. How do you go from Stanford to being evicted? Sure. Um, actually, I you know I graduated from Stanford. I came down here and I started uh, temping, mm -hmm. and I temped at my first entertainment temp job was at Paramount Pictures mm -hmm. at Paramount Home Video back when there was video. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> what's uh, video? I know what's video, right? <laughs> um, and so I uh, was there. I you know I temped for a while, and I actually got hired as a full-time permanent employee, it was a, it was a great uh, opportunity. And I ended up working on all of the marketing campaigns for all of their, all their theatrical releases for the video side, as well as all their television. So I worked on Titanic and Braveheart and Mission Impossible and The Saint. What an and, amazing first job. Yeah, I, it was awesome. It was, it was really great also, cause I had my degrees in psychology. So marketing is a perfect, mm. you know, uh, career space to, to go in from psychology. And it was, about I spent I spent about four years there, and I worked also on the television side. So I worked um, on their um, you know Star Trek Next Gen, Deep Space Nine, Nickelodeon, all of their um, packaging, their little you know labels and stickers and all that stuff, and also did all their trade shows. And so it was it was really cool. Spent four years there, and then I'm like, wait a second, I'm I'm you know I'm having fun, but this isn't what I really came to LA to do because I'm I'm originally from New York, and it's like. Oh, okay. I'm not going back to the cold. <laughs> what, what We're going to figure this out. <laughs> okay, what are we going to do? And so I said, okay, I quit. I quit from my, my job at Paramount. Never quit without having another job. But yeah, that tip number did, one. Yeah, that's tip number one. But um, that, that was okay. I ended up temping again and getting uh, another position uh, with a woman who was a showrunner, TV showrunner. And it was over like the Thanksgiving holiday. And I, you know, I had never met her. She had never come into the office. I just rolled calls for her, you know, mm -hmm. all day, did her schedule, rolled calls. And so like on the Tuesday after the holiday, she came into the office and she's like, you know, my, my assistant, he just had a baby. He's not gonna be able to travel with me to Vancouver. I just got a pilot greenlit, can you come? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I guess. That sounds fun. It sounds fun. Uh, and I had never been on a set before, you know, outside of, you know, just going to an audience ticket, you know, taping thing. Now, just to clarify mm -hmm. what the goal was, what were you wanting to do that you knew marketing wasn't it? Um, I wanted, when I came down here, I wanted to be a producer's assistant. Okay. Um, so, and not a production assistant, but an actual producer's assistant. So it was All right, perfect. so now you have yeah, that job. I, I, have, I had that job. And, you know, it was, it was great uh, to have that experience. We, the, the show that we were on, it was called The Division. Uh -huh. um, and it was uh, produced by Viacom Productions and on Lifetime Television. And it was their first, you know, hit police drama. And Nancy McKeon starred, and I think right now she's on like Dances with the Stars. Or oh something. my gosh! <laughs> and um, she was Jo in fact. She was Jo, right? Fact That's how life. we know her. <laughs> That's how we know. And then. And who is the showrunner? Uh, Deborah Joy Levine. Okay. Um, and so we had, you know, Nancy McKeon, we had Taraji Henson, we had John Hamm, you know, oh before it was Don Draper and you know Cookie. <laughs> it was just way back when. And so it was really great uh, to be on uh, that show. I was on the show for both the pilot and two seasons. And after that show, my, my boss, she went through a contract negotiation. So I was basically unemployed. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay, so now what? And even though I started temping again, 
Um, my mom actually, she was a school teacher and she had been laid off and she couldn't get another gig just because of the weird politics of LAUSD. Mm -hmm. So I had income, but she didn't have income. And so I had my half of the rent, but she didn't have hers. Mm. And, and the, the landlord wouldn't work with us. So it's sort of like, okay, what do you do? You, you give them the $550 or whatever it was. And now you don't have $550 to, to, you know, stay in a hotel. Right. Um, so then you were out. So I, and so I was, uh, we were mm. evicted. It had to have been February, I think of 2003. And literally, belongings on street, and you're like, okay, oh, no. what what do you do? And so I, I you know, it, we had a little apartment in Hancock Park, and so I walked up the street with my mom and my stuff. And there's this huge church on the corner. It was uh, Wilshire United Methodist, and we went into the church, and it was a beautiful church. And you know, it's behind this the the secretary's office is like behind this like wind like almost this liquor store type window where you can't actually <laughs> access her. Um, and she's like, "Oh well, we don't have any homeless programs. Uh, maybe you should try uh, First Baptist Church." Okay, where's that? And okay. Thanks for nothing. Did you, uh, have a, did you have a car? No, I walked. Oh, you were walking with yeah. your stuff? And, yeah, oh. yeah. I mean, bona fide, bona fide homeless. Um, and so... Yeah, this is our greatest fear. Yeah, gonna, yeah. And it's, by our, I mean mine. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's scary. And the scary part is people are living this experience right now. Families are living this experience right now. Yeah. And the, the unfortunate situation is that there is no safety net. Mm -hmm. There's no safety net for families. Um, you have, you know, you have the, you know, the stereotypical homeless vet, um, but there's no safety net for them. And they, you know, served for our country. They've earned a little help. They, yeah. You know, um, and so I ended up, you know, we ended up going down, I think it's like off of Normandy to First Baptist Church and they didn't have a homeless program, but they, were, they had a food bank in the church and the woman in the food bank, I, God bless her, I don't know, remember her name, she had a book of homeless shelters and she's like well here's the book call them see if there's somebody who can take you in good luck to you good luck um she didn't you know she was you know good about it and we stayed in her office and went through and i you know i picked up the phone and started calling and you still have a job at this point um no i was temping so okay. it was sort of like day well, to day yeah day to day very day to day and so i started calling places and unfortunately the way the LA homeless system, health shelter system works is that usually the shelter beds don't start until the rainy season. And so at the time, you know, given our drought, we weren't raining. So a lot of shelters hadn't opened yet. Yeah. You, Hello. You can't have <laughs> a, a bed unless it's raining? Yeah, can't, yeah. Yeah, unless there's, yeah. So you have to sleep on the street. Right, which is why we have the homeless Oh prices. my yeah. God. Um, so we were like, okay, this is, this is not going well. And she, you know, she was really sweet. She actually took pity on us and she said, you know what, I'm going to put you up in a hotel for the night and I'm going to come back and get you in the morning and we're going to go to another facility. And, um, and she did, she, you know, some little random hotel in Hollywood. We went there, spent the night. So I didn't, and me and my mom didn't have to sleep on the street. And she came back the next morning and took us to a facility called PATH, which was people assisting the homeless. Mm. And that's like on off of Beverly. And we spent the whole day there. You know, they do the intake process, find out, you know, what happened, what, what your skill set is, what, what do you need in mm -hmm. terms of services. Um, and we spent the whole day there and they didn't have a placement for us. And so they gave us more ho uh, housing vouchers. Uh, for the next night, and then I, we came back the next day. They also give gives you to, give you tokens to go get on the bus. Come back the next day, mind you. This is with all your belongings still, so you're carting stuff and coming back and carting it again. And you were working on a TV show last week, like well, this, was, well, this was this was probably mind. I was working on a TV show in. Uh, we wrapped May of 2002. This started February 2003. So this was me temping. Okay. You're on a TV show yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but still, yeah. what a juxtaposition. Yeah, in incredible. Okay, so you're dragging your belongings. Dragging your belongings. Come back to PATH the next day. And, you know, I'm a very, I'm a praying person. I'm a faith-filled person. I'm like, okay, Lord, we need a placement. And we need mm -hmm. a safe placement. Um, because the, the thing about the shelter system is that you can get placement in a shelter that's just a bunch of cots, you know, along a wall and yeah. you're exposed to anything and everything. 
And I'm like, I can't, I can't do that. Mm -mm. Um, so I'm just continuously that whole day just praying throughout the day, waiting for them to give us a placement. And, and you've lost all your belongings except what you can carry. Except for what you can carry. And the way so the, your furniture. The, so yes, yeah, so the what the way eviction works is when you are evicted, the landlord is responsible for your belongings and they're responsible for storing your belongings. Uh -huh. But you have they but there's a time for limit. a certain number of days. Yeah. Okay. So you have you have you have the time to, you know, figure out what's your next next place of, of uh, domicile. Um, and then you, you know, figure out a way to get your belongings back because usually they hold them hostage until so you, you can figure whatever. out how you're going to pay okay. them. Um, or you go to court and then the judge says release your belongings and all that. So, um, so I, the, you know, so the belongings was, you know, the furthest thing from my mind. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you sort um, that out in a minute. <laughs> right. Um, so we ended up. Uh, that that uh, afternoon, you know, we'd been there since eight in the morning. So at five at night, uh, they let us know that they had a placement for us in um, the Catholic Charities Good Shepherd Center for Homeless Women, and uh, and that was their transitional facility. Um, so in this facility, you know, we we were ecstatic because you have your own private room that me and my mom shared. So I you know wasn't sharing with a stranger. Um, that you know they had bathroom showers and a full kitchen where they serve three meals a day and they also you know had other services you know mental health services and job services and all that stuff so it was full service um and i was very Wonderful. prayerful very like hallelujah we can we yeah. can at least you know we can be work okay. with this. yeah um and it and the time frame though they give you six weeks in that space so it's like okay after six weeks they do a new assessment and and you figure out what's your next step so time to hustle um, yeah so but the the beautiful thing about the good shepherd center is that they don't force you to leave every morning and go find a job you know they because being homeless as you could well imagine is a very stressful thing yes it's like you need time to figure out your life and you need time to be quiet so they just let you, if you need to sleep, you can sleep. If you want to read, you can read. You just, they need you to kind of get in the right frame of mind. Um, so we lived there for six weeks. And in that time, I was able to start collecting unemployment mm -hmm. and um, also food stamps. Back in the day, there was actual books of stamps as opposed to an EBT card nowadays. And the way the facility works is that you had to turn over all of your money and your um, food stamps to the, to the house so that it would be safe for you. Yeah. Um, so we were able to, you know. Wait, as payment for being there? No, or no, no, so just to hold it. So you can so, save so up. So you can save, absolutely. Okay. So the, the say. hope is, yeah, for the, for the six weeks, you can save, you know, maybe, you know, $1,000 yeah. and, you that know, you have month. a cushion, you have some yeah. type of cushion. Um, and so I was able to, to do that. Um, and then, you know, the question is after six weeks, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Um, now while I was there, it was very interesting, you know, it's sort of like, okay, you have this degree, you need a job, you know, so you, you know, you apply, you have, you have your resume, you fill out the applications. I actually filled out an application for I think it was like a city job or a federal job. So I took a test, mm -hmm. me and my mom, we took the test. And you know, I'm, I'm okay in terms of taking tests. I you got, went to Stanford. I, went to Stanford. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was on the top of the list of and my course. mom was the second. So I got like a 96 and she got like a 95. Yeah. Got, got the test results, got an interview with a panel. And it was the, the job, mind you, I have a degree in psychology. It was for like an eligibility specialist for HUD or whatever. So you would actually be processing, you know, people who need housing. Yeah. And the panel, you know, when I did the interview, they were like, well, we don't think you'd work because, you know, you, you don't really deal with this population. I'm like, <laughs> lady, I am this I population. Am this, population. <laughs> I, this, I, is this, is, this is my life. So they didn't hire me. And I'm like, wow, okay. What, what do you I say mean, to how that? how weird. <laughs> how do you, what, what do you say to that? But what I did was I said, okay, I came here to be in the entertainment industry. So obviously that door shut for a reason. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to. Yeah, you were about to take a weird turn yeah, off was, of right. your path oh, because of this path. circumstance. Right. So I'm like, okay, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I will do. And I happened to be in the, in the shelter's um, living room and they had this little library. And... 
I like to read and read like fun stuff. So there was a, a book, it was a crime novel, never forget it. It was Q is for Quarry by Sue Grafton. Mm -hmm. And she passed away recently, um, earlier this year. And it was the best book I had read in eons because it read like a TV show. Yeah. And it was like, oh my God, this could be, you know, I, and it was like, this could be a TV show. And from that moment, I knew I can, what it, no matter what the situation was, my mind, I'm a producer. Yeah. I'm a producer. And so when we had to go through our assessment after six weeks and they're like, well, they have, um, they have another facility, which were little apartments where you can, you know, have your own space and you come and go, but they still had a curfew and, you know, different rules that you had to abide. And, you know, the kitchen was downstairs and you had to have a communal kitchen. And, you know, my mother and I, we went through and looked at it and it was a lovely facility. And they also had a place for women that had children and their children could come and live with them. And, you know, my mom and I talked about it and I, you know, I looked at her, I said, you know what, if we decide to go into this facility, we're going to be stuck in their system and stuck in the system. And we can't, we can't be stuck. And so we decided to just go live in a hotel. Mm -hmm. And at that time, one of my friends, she was selling her old beat up Ford Thunderbird. So <laughs> <laughs> she, she let me, uh, you know, buy it from her, you know, over the course of 10 weeks for a hundred dollars a week or something. And we ended up moving to a hotel in Pasadena because my mom had always wanted to live in Pasadena. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and we lived there and I started temping again. And I ended up getting a job where I had to travel and I had to travel to DC. So there would have been no way for me to have been able to stay at that transitional facility because of their rules. You had yeah. to come back at nine o'clock every night, blah, blah, blah. What was this job? Um, it was, I was actually doing a live event for Tavis's Youth Development Foundation. He used to- um, Tavis head. Smiley. Tavis Smiley, yes. Mm -hmm. And I was working with the, the foundation head to, it was like 600 kids in, I think it was Catholic University, their facilities, their dorms, and it was leadership training. Mm -hmm. And so it was basically just organizing the, the, the event and, and all of the residential stuff that they had to do. And so it was great because, you know, I'm back into that space of producing. When I came back, you know, still tempted around the, the industry, but I couldn't land anything solid. And we were there for about a year. And in, in the hotel system, you can't live in a hotel contiguously. Um, if it's not a residential hotel, if it's just like your regular, you know, like travel yeah. lodge or whatever. So you have to move around? So you have to move every 28 days. And you can come back, yeah. but you have to move. So we got into that cycle. And at a certain point, when I realized, okay, this isn't working, I'm like, well, I, because I'm from New York, I'm like, I could be homeless in New York. You know, <laughs> if I'm gonna be homeless, I can at least be around my family, I can at least be, you yeah. know, someplace else. So my mom and I decided, okay, let's take a road trip. And so we got in that beat up Ford Thunderbird with all of our stuff, and over the summer, it was 2004, June 2004, and we drove back home to New York. Okay, now. Let's just break this down for uh -huh. a second, because this is interesting to me. You're in the hotel, mm -hmm. which I got to think is at least 50 bucks a day. Like, how like four, It was like $468 a week, I think. So I had to temp, you know, to make sure I made at least made the rent. And, yeah, uh -huh. but it's like then you're in a position where you, you can't, can't get, get ahead head, enough not because at all. you could pay for an apartment. apartment that right. Means. But you can't. Oh. But, you, but you don't have enough for a down payment. for Right, you know, so the, you then you're caught in this cycle. You're caught in the cycle. And so at a certain Lord. point, it's sort of like, okay, what do you do? Um, so I, we went back to New York and my aunt, uh, she, she passed away several years ago, but she had an apartment in the Bronx mm. and she lived in South Carolina. So we're like, well, there yeah. you go. At least, you know, we have, a, have an a, a roof over our heads. We have no money. We have no food. We have a roof over our heads. <laughs> so we ended up going back home to New York in June. And it was right around the time where my best friend from high school, she had just had a baby. So I was able to hang out with her, hang out with the baby, help her do that. But I'm like, okay, maybe I should, you know, get a job at Columbia, get a job somewhere. You know, this is New York. You yeah, can, you know, whatever. You can do anything. I can do anything. And I applied for a lot of positions and nothing, again, would break. And I was like, okay, 
I'm at your mercy, Lord. What do I do? Yeah, how are you keeping the faith all this time? <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a woman of faith. I exercise faith. And, and faith for me is an action verb. You mm -hmm. can't, it's not just, you know, read a book, read a verse. You actually have to live it. You have yeah. to walk through it. And, you know, the, the, the problem is you have all of these things around you and you have to keep focus. You have to know, okay, irrespective of all the stuff that's going on, you know God has a plan for you. You know it. So you're gonna you're gonna walk. You know when you know the people talk about you know or you know you just read Psalm 23. You walk through the valley of. You're actually walking. You're moving through. Mm -hmm. There's stuff going all around you. You are walking through, and you have to keep walking. You can't get stuck in that space. You have to keep moving. You can't get depressed in that space. So are you able to keep your keep your attitude up? Yeah, and, and especially you have a new baby around, yeah. you're, you know, you're just kind of fiddling around with, with their life because it's all brand new. So you're not really focusing so much on your situation. So I'm hanging out in New York in the summer. No, who, who, you know, it's not bad. That's not terrible. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> um, and hanging out with my best friend. So I got a call from Tavis's organization and they needed someone to help do their trade show. They were doing this huge technology trade show and it was going to start, I think, like in October. Where? Here in LA. Oh. I, I'm in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, okay, Lord, what, what, what do I do? And I don't have a place here. You know, right. I don't have a, any living options. So my best friend, and I didn't even ask her. I was just like, oh, you know, I want to move. I need to move back to LA. You know, I'm hope I'm hopefully I can get this job and you know get set. And one day we had been watching like all these movies, you know, like City of God and Lord of the Rings, uh, Return of the King and all this fun stuff. And she had, and my, my birthday's in August. And so she had given me a, a birthday card and it was fat. So mm -hmm. I waited till I got home and I opened that card. And even to this day, she put so much money, cash oh. money in that card. I mean, enough for me to get back to LA, live okay for about three months. Wow. Yeah. It was brilliant. So there's a good friend. Amazing, beautiful friend. Um, Did you take your mom with you? No, my mom wanted to stay in New York. Okay. So my mom stayed in New York because uh, at the time she had, you know, her father was there, her her sister was there. She had her life. Um, she had her life, but later on she she came back out here with me. But at that time she stayed, and I was able to come back out here. And one of my uh, friends uh, let me stay in her her guest room for a month and it was right near Tavis's office so I could, didn't have a car so I could just walk because by that time you know the Ford Thunderbird <laughs> that wasn't that, making two cross yeah that, that wasn't gonna that wasn't gonna work <laughs> um and so I started working and started working and saving up and I was able to finally you know get a place and I ended up as his event coordinator and moved up, you know, to event manager, to event producer, to documentary producer, to talk show producer, um, and, and all the other, you know, jobs that we, we did along the way. And I worked for Tavis for 13 years. I'm so relieved. <laughs> Yes, yes. It worked out. It did work out. It did work out. And it was, it, and you know, it, it was a long, hard slog, but it was one of those continuously persevering, believing that you're going to be okay. You know, you have to believe it. Otherwise, you can't walk down that path. And more than you okay, know. you became a producer. You yeah. Did what you yeah. wanted to do. Yes, yes. And when I, um, became his television producer where I was producing his talk show, I was able to join the Producers Guild. Mm -hmm. And so, because I had hundreds of hours. <laughs> um, and we, you know, I joined the Guild and that was so cool because, you know, the Producers Guild is unlike any other Guild in that it's not a union. It's mm -hmm. not like your your Writers Guild or your Directors Guild. They're not trying to get you gigs per se. Um, they are, it's a networking organization and it's a trade uh, organization that really supports the the position of producer in all of the in in all of its iterations. So whether it's television, filmmaking, uh, web series, you know, documentary, it it runs the gamut. 
And so, you know, in joining this organization, um, you know, I ended up becoming a mentor for the diversity program. The program has been in existence for 14 years. We're coming up on our 15th anniversary. And it has, you know, really helped nurture a lot of um, underserved voices mm -hmm. um, to help them figure out how to prepare their pitch, prepare that project to start shopping it in the marketplace and understanding what it takes to actually shop a project in the marketplace. You know, yeah. what, you know, what are the physical things you need and what are the, the things you need just in your repertoire to, to get things moving. So how do you present it? How do you talk about it? Right. What does Absolutely. your book look like, your presentation? Yeah. And also like if you're doing, you know, indie film, what is your business plan? What's your distribution plan? Um, you know, how are you going to reach that audience or what's your idea of, of reaching that audience? So setting um, people up for success. Yes, absolutely. And I, you know, I had been a mentor for that program for several years, and um, then I joined their selection committee. So I understood the process of how we curate a room so mm -hmm. that the room is a collaborative space, and you know, we have both emerging and mid-level producers, so people can help out each other. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the program, you're, we're all colleagues, and we're all working in the same, you know, in the same industry, so we can always help out each other. And then they had asked me to chair it. And I was like, oh, okay, sure, I'll chair it. <laughs> You've come a long way, baby. Yeah, I know. And <laughs> so I, I chair, I, currently I chair the program. And no one ever tells you, oh, it's a lot more work than just <laughs> right. mentoring. It's and, not just a tiara. <laughs> not, not even. <laughs> but, it, you know, having done it for two years, you know, you're always constantly promoting the program and you're trying to make sure you're connecting your alumni with opportunities and, you know, making sure, you know, they have as much information that they need in terms of keeping on trend with all the, you know, all the new things that are going on. So, you know, VR and XR and all the different R's and all the, you know, <laughs> the different opportunities people may have to do like digital series and all that. So, you know, it, it really becomes like a full-time gig. So yeah. it's, but it's not, it's volunteer. Are you, <laughs> yeah. So are you creating events and creating programming? And also you must be incredibly networked. Right. And, and that's the, the, the beauty of the PGA is that, you know, we're, we're all producers in all these different spaces. So, you know, we're talking folks that are veterans in the industry that have produced Oscar winning and mm -hmm. Emmy winning projects. And we have, you know, the reality folks, and we have the documentary folks, and just, all, you know, a whole group of... And of when are you letting people. in the podcasters? And, and <laughs> well, I believe we have a new media council, and I don't know if podcasting works, but it may you may have to have some video with it. All right, I I'm going to go check. You have to, yeah, definitely check. <laughs> um, but the, the beauty of membership is once you're... Once you are a member, you have access to all of these different people. And so what we do, at, you know, what I do as chair is I help put together what that, it's an eight-week program, so what are people going to be learning over the course of the eight weeks? Mm -hmm. um, they meet every week, twice weekly in the evening. Um, we feed people because we know people are coming <laughs> from work, so we do feed people. And the program is free. Amazing. Um, and we you know, teach them everything from premise development to log line uh, construction to pitch development to you know budgeting and scheduling and film finance and distribution and marketing and advertising um, and publicity and you know all the the new things that are coming on so we you know we have guest speakers every night who are either you know the top producers in in the guild as well as different executives um, former we had you know, the former head of Fox and the former chair of Sony. I mean, just amazing, amazing people with great credentials to help, you know, just guide them along in this process. So you understand, if, you know, if you're going in to pitch something, the person that's on the other side of that table, they have listened to about a thousand pitches. Mm -hmm. So your pitch is, has to stand out. It has to, otherwise it's going to be another, you know, it'll be 1,001. Yeah. So what do you bring to the table that's going to 
to really wow them, you know, and it doesn't have to be the bells and whistles of, of video. It's just how do you present your story and how do you pick the right people to pitch to that, that are actually looking for that story. Right. Um, so we, you know, we, we teach people that because you can, you know, you can throw the cards up in the air and see what lands or you could be more strategic about right. it. Don't pitch to the wrong people. Right. Because they don't want to hear a pitch that they're never going to buy. Yeah, your sci-fi people don't want to hear your rom-com. Not at all. <laughs> um, not unless there's, you know, Battlestar Galactica backdrop, you know. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, so we, we, we train folks on that and we create a very intimate room. So we only accept 10 projects per cycle and that allows us to, to curate that balanced room that is collaborative and it's safe, you know, so people may have things they want to talk about or experiences they want to talk about and they want to create a safe space. So that's what I've been doing for the past uh, two years as chair and I have two, two more to go. Um, so it's been fun. How have you seen that committee and its focus change? I, I want to say in the last couple of years, we seem to be getting a little momentum. We, we seem to be getting momentum, but I'm always pushing the rock up the hill in terms of the now what. So mm -hmm. if I prepare, you know, these 10 folks or these 10 projects to go out to the marketplace and I have 185 alumni, who are they going to pitch to? Because as we all know, this industry is all based on who you know. Right. And what I, I always say is not just who you know, it's who knows you. And so if people don't know you, are they going to take that meeting? If people don't know you, are they going to read that, that little log line? So how do they get access? And I think right now there's a groundswell for a very small subset of people. Mm -hmm. And usually that subset are people who are already in the industry. Would, would have it have been more interesting to you know, find people who could take the industry in a, in a different direction where you're opening up new voices? You know, it's are, about new voices. Are we actually seeing more sales from new voices? Or do you think we're just hearing a lot more talk about the numbers? I think we're hearing a lot more talk about numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, every, you know, just like with the with this program, there, there are a bunch of programs. There's a lot of programs. Yes, there are. <laughs> there, I mean, it, it's, it's insane. And the problem is a lot of people get stuck in the program. You know, they, so you, you, you go to the program and then you go and get another program and then you go and you get another program, but you're never actually in the industry. Right. At some point, it, it almost feels like a delay tactic. It, oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, am I not yeah. crazy thinking yeah. that? No, not at all. I, I think it's like, yeah, you're is, ready. You're super talented. Yeah. You have a fresh voice. Yeah. We'll be in that program right. for a year. Right. Exactly. And then we'll think about it. Right. And then, and then you don't think about it, really. Right. You move on to the next person and say, oh, yeah, you're, you're wonderful. You're talented. You go into that program. You know, it's a, it's a cycle. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, my hope. Although it's better than not having it, right? It's. Is it? <laughs> it it's, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Is it a step in the right direction? I... It's, it's a step in the right direction in terms of preparation. Because you want people to be prepared. You don't want to hear a bunch of bad pitches. No one, no right. producer, no executive wants to go and listen to a bunch of bad pitches. But at some point, but, let's pretending people aren't prepared. Right, right. So if they, if you are prepared, now what's the now what for them? What's yeah. that next step to get them, whether it's staffed on a show or get you know get them in front of financiers if they have a great business plan for their indie film? What is what is that next step? Let's and I open think, the door with the money. Yeah, open the door with the money. And and you know the the. The crazy thing is that there is so much money in this industry. Yeah. You know, there's so much opportunity in this industry. And I think, you know, our biggest challenge is giving people access beyond the diversity hire, mm -hmm. beyond the, oh, go to XYZ persons or organizations or guilds program. Um, we have to start actually valuing the voices and valuing the stories. And I, I'm hoping that you know, in, in seeing movies like, you know, Coco or Girl's Trip or Crazy Rich Asians or, uh, you know, pa Black Panther, people, I'm hoping, will say, hmm, there's some money that we could be making. <laughs> you How know? many times do we have to prove it? Right. And, you know, and when you have, you know, you hear the, the, uh, the story about um, the, the writer and the producer of Crazy Rich Asians, um, you know, going around town trying to shop their project and, you know, the one of the their responses was, oh, well, can you make the main character white? Well, it kind of defeats the purpose of the whole story. No, it's not <laughs> crazy rich Asians <laughs> right. and one white person. Right. It's like, it, it's, <laughs> it, 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 it kind of
kind of defeats the purpose. And that but, movie was so delicious. And, and and the beauty of it is, it kind of proves a point. If yeah. you, there are so many audiences. We have seven billion people on this planet. Guess what? And and there are so <laughs> many of those billions that have access to you know the infrastructure that makes you know digital work in their space. So whether mm. that's electricity and Wi-Fi and all that, they have access. So you're looking at all of these people and you're discounting that you know whatever five ten dollars that they could actually pay for a movie or pay for a netflix because you're not giving them any content and that's craziness it's it's really bad business it it baffled it's baffled my mind for mm -hmm. a long time why we think that only white men from 18 to 24 are the only people buying anything and, and, and they when don't we have, actually know and and ad, ad people know, that's so not the case. They if don't you, have the money. They don't have the money. They don't have, you know, millennials don't have disposable income. They don't. They just don't. They should be marketing and, to women over 50. Absolutely. And that is that is the key. That is the key. And, but the problem is it's not sexy, you know. And when you, when you, you know. Maybe not people, yet. <laughs> but, you know, when you, um, you know, when you're dealing with the this ad world, you know, coming from marketing, Everything is, well, what's going to make it pop? What's going to make it interesting? What's going to make it sexy? And, okay, no, you don't think of your grandma as sexy, but she has the money to spend, mm -hmm. you know? And maybe let's get out of that kind of old, staid way of thinking in terms of spending dollars because all you want is that transactional relationship. Right. And to, to leave it on the table, leaving money on the table makes absolutely no sense. It's just dumb. It is. It's just like <laughs> all the data shows that companies make more money when there are women on their board of directors. Yeah. Why doesn't every company have a fifty percent female board of directors? It would be helpful. It, it just <laughs> makes if, you think. If you want, if you want more, you know, value for your stock stockholders. But but no. So what else is working there if the, the data is not convincing you? Like yeah. It's well, I, I think it's you know it's the idea that you have to change and people don't like change i don't like change no one likes change yeah. but when you see that change works for you when you see that oh this is going to help my bottom line or it's going to help that you know uh, increase the value of my company or it's going to expose um you know my company to a, a whole host of new audiences then hopefully those folks say oh hmm, maybe i should hmm, maybe this is a good way to go and yeah, I think it's a wave. That means with a wave comes an ebb and a flow. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, I don't surf, I, you know, don't surf, <laughs> but you can catch that wave and you can ride it and you can actually have an amazing time. Yeah, you might like it. You might like it and you might benefit from it. And you know, it's not about, oh, it's the right thing to do or the good thing to do. No, it, this is business, mm -hmm. this is just, it's business. So get to the audiences that you, you wanna get to. Um, and if you don't know how, then, that, then the question is, how do you put infrastructure in place to actually reach them and be authentic about it and actually achieve it. It's about, you know, building your infrastructure as well. Well, you diversify every room. Uh, yes, yes. And, you know, you have diverse executives and diverse, not just, you know, ethnicity or religion or LGBTQ, but diverse in thought mm -hmm. because you want the people around your table to have new ideas and keep it fresh. You know, you always read that, oh, the industry may be dying and all this. <laughs> and, you know, yes, the music industry industry imploded yeah that doesn't mean people stop singing right it doesn't mean that they stop making music it just means the way that the distribution mechanism has changed right and all of the infrastructure around it has changed so instead of thinking that oh well the, the industry is not going to die no but the method will change and you want to be on the forefront of change you actually want to be a pioneer of change that's the best place to be because now you are actually directing where people are going to follow you. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome, awesome. I don't know what to say after that. Awesome. No, I'm going to ask you more things, but okay. that was really good. Sure. <laughs> you stumped me. Sure. Um, what do you make of, and we've talked about it some, but what do you make of kind of the collective roar of women that happened last year? I... I'm happy that all of the darkness and the mess and that, that horrible quid pro quo mm -hmm. life has been revealed, but what happens now? Yeah. You know, again, you can create a bunch of programs, you can create a bunch <laughs> of organizations, 
But what what are the the actionable items? What do people just you know the 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 weird thing about the this industry is if you're an independent producer, you don't have like an HR person. You don't have a system. So how do we craft a world that's a safe space for both the employer and the employee? And no one's really kind of gone down that path just yet because mm -hmm. it, it's such a monstrous path to go to. What do we do if everyone's independent? You know, how do you, do you get some type of liability insurance? Oh, well, I'm sure the insurance industry would love that. Well, they do. There <laughs> but, is liability insurance. But right. then who's making a claim because it's so, because the power differential. Right. And you're right. It's always been the Wild West. Right. It's the last industry it, to yes. deal with any sort of HR right. protocol. And then here we are. And and here we are. Okay, and, time to sort it out. Right. And and the that's going, I think, also going to be a very long road. And again, if you don't keep that vision ahead in terms of what the ultimate goal is, we're going to get distracted and, you know, the movement or, you know, this moment won't be a movement, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I look at it as, okay, it's a great beginning, but we're, what are the next steps and how do we actually create infrastructure change for everyone? So, you know, not just the, the big studios, but everyone, because we're all running around here as independent producers. Right. And, and there's, I know there's a lot of different groups mm -hmm. doing pieces of the work. Right. And I'm sure they, and I'm sure there's so much work to be done that it has to be that way to a certain There's a degree. lot of pieces. There are a lot of pieces. <laughs> um, but I think also it's, you know, oh, well, I belong to this group. You know, there's a lot of politics involved and it's sort of like, okay, let's focus on the mission, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and let's actually achieve something as opposed to, oh, I'm a part of this group or I'm on this board and okay, well, that's lovely. So to that point, mm -hmm. can you say what the vision is? Oh God, um, do, we, do we know what the vision is? Yeah, I, I think, think that's the hard part, <laughs> I right? Think, I think the vision should be, well, I don't know if it is, but I think the vision should be to create a safe environment for all people involved. That should be the vision. Mm -hmm. Now, it's such a broad vision. And, you know, yes, people have consensual relationships. Okay. But are you creating a safe environment for everyone involved? So whether you're the boss or the PA, everyone needs to feel like my career isn't, you know, beholden to what I do outside of my career. Mm -hmm. you know? Or what that person might say. Yeah. And that feels like the baseline. Like mm -hmm. if we can just have that, that yes. the, a safe playing field, yeah. Yeah. then we can talk about all the other gradations of equality and inclusion Absolutely. and opportunity. Absolutely. But yeah, that's the baseline. And, and that's the key and, and for, for the diversity conversation as well. It's, it's creating this space where people are respected. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a respect thing. If you don't respect you know, this random person coming in that you don't think has a, a, a universal story to tell, you're going to miss out, right. you know? So you create that safe space for everyone. Yeah. Because I think one of the mistakes was the expectation that everybody fit into mm -hmm. the white mm -hmm. male mm -hmm. mold mm -hmm. to be successful. Right. And, you know, it, it's worked for a while, you know? <laughs> it's, it's not going to work anymore. But it's, it's not, and it's not that... That mold doesn't work, but it's not an equal way to work. Well, that doesn't allow everyone their authentic voice. Right, right. Because that's not that's the not majority everyone's of the experience. experience. Right, it's right. not everyone's experience. Um, and it's it's funny when uh, I, had, I had a uh, opportunity to travel to Europe about five years ago, and I'd spent like a month there. And the most amazing moment was I was walking. I was in Florence, and it was early in the morning. And I was walking down the street. And it was quiet, and I realized there was a, um, a class of children, like probably kindergarten. And, you know, I don't speak Italian, but they started singing this little song, and they were like, shh, shh, and they sang the song, and they, shh, shh. And so I looked at the building, and I looked at the kids, and I realized they were in front of a library, and they were being taught how to go into a library <laughs> and, you know, what the rules were of being mm -hmm. quiet in the library. And I, that struck me so deeply because it's a universal moment. Mm -hmm. We all, regardless of what we speak, 
have this space where there's a specific rule. And the universality of that made me realize that irrespective of where you live, whether you're here, the Middle East, you know, Africa, South America, we're all having similar experiences. And that equality mm -hmm. is, is what's so perfect about humanity. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. What is next for you? Oh, I have no clue. <laughs> um, I would love, all right now, I, like I said, I transitioned um, out of uh, the documentary film space and I started writing. So I would love to have the time <laughs> to shop my projects and see if I can get out there into the ether. And I would actually like to kind of do what I do now for the PGA, but do it in a um, either a network or a studio space and help cultivate these new voices, you know, not in, in the, under the umbrella of diversity, but just in the, under, under the umbrella of, we need new voices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and these jobs are starting to pop up. And, and yeah. So that I think will be my next uh, plan of action just to figure out, you know, how to navigate that universe. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, but, you know, I have, you know, my transition script from my experience. Yeah, you have stories um, to tell. Yeah. And I, I, I love the process. And, you know, when I, thought about, you know, what I want to do with my life. The whole idea of producing for me is so cool because you take an idea, it literally is one sentence, and then you see it manifest, whether that's on the big screen or a little screen, you actually go through the process and see it manifest. And that is like, that's amazing. It is amazing. Mm -hmm. What other advice would you have for people who are just thinking about it, just starting out? Do as much research as you can. That's first. So know what you want, that's second. If you are here in LA, you have to network because like I said earlier, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Mm -hmm. And what do they know you for? You know, are you like the best realtor? That's great because I'm sure realtors have amazing stories that need to be told, why not? You know, you, you have uh, a show like House of Cards. It's about Ma Ma House of Cards, I think. House of Lies, or House of Lies. I think it's one of those. Well, uh, House of Cards is about the White House. All right, so House of Lies with okay. uh, Don Cheadle. It's about management consulting. Really? Mm -hmm. you know, so you have, you have a, a, a show that has, you know, random, random jobs, but have interesting stories. Yeah. So, you know, know what you want, become an expert in something, you know, and have that ex expert voice, that authentic voice that is new and only for you. Um, and I think also, you know, be kind, you know, be kind mm -hmm. to people. We have, a, you know, as we can, we have seen, there's a lot of mess mm -hmm. in, in, in the world and in this industry. And it doesn't have to be. You don't have to be the, the shrill, crazy person who yells and throws <laughs> staplers. You don't have to be that way. And why would it? Did your mama raise you that way? In fact, don't be that <laughs> way. So be Enough kind. with the stapler throwers. Right? You know, be kind. Um, <laughs> don't be, be known for that. Right. And, and you, don't ha you don't have to be to get your point across. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, be kind in that process because, you, you know, you never know who you're going to meet, who you're going to interact with and, you know, what they're going to hear about you. You know, so your reputation will you, precede you. Your reputation always <laughs> precedes you. Definitely. Definitely. So I, I think those are the key, you know, know what you want, you know, do the research. If you want, you know, when I first started, I knew I wanted to be a producer's assistant mm -hmm. because I wanted to understand everything that that producer has to do. And the best way to do it is to assist so you can see the, see the process. Smart. And, you know, you can't jump ahead. I mean, I, you know, I always like hearing the stories about, oh, I came in and, you know, I sold a script and made a million dollars. You know, that's great. Yeah, who, who, who wants to discount that? But in that process, are you learning? You know, did you learn how to negotiate? You know, because, yeah, you made a million dollars, but what did you learn in the process? Right. You know, it's so, hard to start at the top. It's right. a big learning it, curve. It's, yes. And you need you need the time to to go through the failures, to go through the missteps, to go through those challenges, because it's only going to make you better. You know, it's I mean, people don't like those experiences, but <laughs> it really does make you better. You know, I really didn't like, you know, having the experience of being homeless. But now that I have been that, I know what that feels like and I can empathize and I can see, you know, if you look at just the city of LA, if the if your minimum wage is ten dollars an hour and your average one bedroom apartment is eighteen hundred, everyone, everyone is gonna be homeless. And 
that's just basic math. That's basic accounting because you're not going to have, you know, the one bedroom apartment will not fit four or five people that are making minimum wage to live. That's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, you know, you have to, to experience things and, and live through them and, and learn from them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to The Other 50%, A Herstory of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I would like to thank Sasheen Artis for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out in letters for added features, bios of our guests, and the merch. You can also follow us on all the social media platforms and also go subscribe to Exit 38 and the Kiss My Age show. Thanks for listening. See you next time.